Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Podcast, presented by Canon Press. Welcome to the podcast. This is Douglas Wilson. This is episode 218. Episode 218. So, as we speak, as I'm recording this, we are dealing with all sorts of disrupted supply chains. There are freighters off the coast of America that are stacked piled high with uh, uh, containers, and we're having difficulty getting things delivered on time. Anybody who's engaged in any kind of project, like building a house, knows that it's difficult to get things in a timely way. And when you get them, they're expensive and there's all, there's all sorts of supply chain monkey shines, right? The thing I want to remind everybody of is that Jesus is Lord of the supply chain. Uh, when Jesus says, the lilies of the field, neither consider the lilies of the field, Solomon in all his splendor was not arrayed like any of them. They do not toil, they do not spin, and yet they're gloriously arrayed. The birds of the air are fed. What Jesus is telling us, he's saying that we need to trust God when we pray and we ask God for our daily bread, when we ask God to provide for us, when we ask God for food and shelter and clothing. Jesus is very explicit on this. He says, "Your, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. These are these are things that you need, and you can trust Him to take care of you." Christians confess that Jesus is Lord, and that confession means that he's Lord of the supply chain. Everything is in the palm of his hand, not just some things. He doesn't say, look, trust me for your daily bread unless a Democrat's in office and screws up the supply chain. Uh, That's not how it works. We need to trust God, period, end. We need to trust him for our food. We need to trust him for our raiment. We need to trust him for our provision, we need to trust him for our work. A lot of Christians were abruptly thrown into a crisis moment on vaccine mandates where they were told you've got to agree to receive the vaccine, for example, by this Friday, or you're out. Yeah, if you don't receive the, the vaccine, you lose your job. And you think, well, what am I going to do about my mortgage? Or what am I going to do about feeding my family? What am I going to do about... And it's as though all of us were put in a position where we had to make the same surrender and, pro- and work through the same issues at the same time. All of us have to trust God together, right? So, it's easy for American Christians who have had it, uh, yeah, I mean, we're kind of fat and sassy, and we've had it so good for so long that it was very easy for us to assume that overflowing grocery stores were somehow a birthright, that just because we live in North America, this was going to happen automatically. Well, uh, no, it, there, there have been famines in the world. There have been shortages. There have been man-made famines in the world, like Stalin's, uh, Stalin's uh, treatment of the Ukraine. That was a man-made famine. There, there have been famines that were brought about by men sort of inadvertently. There were famines that didn't have anything to do with man. It has to do with uh, God uh, closing up the heavens. In all of this, we are to look to our Heavenly Father. Uh, We are not to look to the state to save us from this. You see, and and there's a fundamental uh, reason for this. We shouldn't look to the culprit to fix the problem the culprit created. And yet, there's a perennial temptation to do exactly that. When um, Jezebel married Ahab and came into came into power in Israel, the kingdom of Israel to the north, she brought in Baal worship, and Baal worship was a fertility religion, and so she brought it. She wanted to establish the worship of Baal uh, in Israel, and um, and it was a green movement, right? Fertility. Let's make let's make the crops uh, really flourish. Let's uh, let's accentuate the fertility of this place. And then, of course, God uses Elijah to turn the, turn the rain off, and there's a famine for three and a half years. And so, they brought, in the god of, they brought in the god and goddess of green, 
and everything turned crispy brown. And that's the way, right? That's, that's the way it goes. When, when we trust God, basically, when we look to the state to, to solve the supply chain problems, we have, to do, we have to do this recognizing that the state is the one that caused the supply chain, the supply chain problems. You don't look to the arsonist to put out the fire. You don't look to the burglar to catch the criminal. You just want to make sure that you trust God. Trust God, trust God, trust God. Let me give you the Sunday school answer one more time. Trust God. Always we, will be God. we are continuing on with podcast episode 218. And we come now to another word study. And this word is a word, um, this, this word is one that is sinful or not depending on context, again. And this word is ekbalo, ekbalo, E-K-B-A-L-L-O. This is a compound word. Balo is the Greek word for throw, and ek is out, right? So ekbalo is to cast out, throw out. So ekbalo means cast out. And it would obviously not be sinful. This word would not be sinful if, for example, it's talking about Jesus casting out devils which most of the uses of this word in the New Testament are. Ekbalo, most of the time, is talking about Jesus or his followers casting out devils. Or it could be something as simple as sailors casting out anchors. So ekbalo is not an essentially sinful activity. But there are other times when it is a different matter. Luke 6.22, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Notice that. Cast out your name as evil. Now, they don't cast out your name because you're so good. They don't cast out your name because you're a wonderful person. They don't cast out your name because of your cute boyish smile. They cast out your name as evil. And it's for the Lord's because it's because of your association with Christ but they cast out your name as evil. The verb used there is ekbalo. Now, obviously, a person sinning, if they cast out someone's name as evil because that person is associated with Jesus Christ. And again, the, the, the scriptural requirement for us in such instances is to rejoice and be glad when people cast out your name as evil. Jesus teaches us we should rejoice and be exceedingly glad we should go around the corner, dance a little jig in the presence of God. Uh, in one of Jesus' parables, and again, he sent a third, and they wounded him also and cast him out. So this would be an example of the, the owner of the estate sending messengers to collect his um, due from the uh, people managing the vineyard or the, the estate, whatever. And when they grab him and cast him out, Ekbalo, they are doing something that is very sinful. They are being wicked men. Another, in, another sinful instance of this would be 3 John verse 10. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us. He's talking about diatrophies. Prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Now, this is a good example. We even have in the New Testament an example of godly people being thrown out of the church. It's not just godly people thrown it's not like it's not just being cast out of the synagogue where you had the people of God who'd been going for centuries and some of them had become corrupt and then the old wineskins problem and then someone comes along believes in Jesus and then the the rulers of the synagogue cast this Jesus follower, this follower of this, um, this new Messiah figure, they cast him out of our highly respected, well-established synagogue. <laughs> Notice that Diotrephes got power in the church within the first century, well within the first century. The apostles are still alive, or at least John the apostle is still alive, and the friends of an apostle are being cast out of a Christian church because of their connection with John, or because of their lack of connection with Diotrephes. So, ekbalo means to cast out, 
Whether or not it's sinful it depends entirely on who's doing the casting out and what they are being cast out from and why. So, finishing up our podcast, episode 218, this is the book review section, and I wanted to talk about a book by Leonard Ravenhill, and this book is uh, called Revival God's Way. Revival God's Way. And I need to give a little bit of background first, and I want to I, I want to be careful to qualify this review because it's it's a mixed review. I think that there's things that are very uh, very good about uh, this book, Revival God's Way, and things that are are distressing and troubling. Right. So I've been familiar with Leonard Ravenhill's name for a long time. You can't be in evangelical circles and handle books and uh, you know without running across his name. He was a his life overlapped, his life and style overlapped with uh, that of A.W. Tozer. I think he uh, lived much later, d- died later than Tozer did, but they knew each other. They interacted with each other, and he was very much in the um, same vein, Al- although I do think that Tozer was a bit more balanced. I read a lot of Tozer when I was uh, in the Navy and was shaped and formed and oriented by him. He had a lot of good things to say, and um, I finally decided, well, hey, I I need to read a book by Ravenhill. I knew that Ravenhill was a um, a revivalist, a, a revival preacher, and and an old school revival preacher, uh, not the kind that uh, ske- you know has your booking agent get in contact with the Holy Spirit and schedule a week of revival meetings from September thirteenth uh, through eighteenth that you know, Antioch Baptist Church here in Alabama or, you know, wherever it is. So there is, there is revival culture, uh, but Ravenhill seems to be more the real deal where he, he really earnestly sees the need for revival and he's a, he's a hot, hot gospel preacher, right? And so I, I listened to this book. Uh, I listened to it on Audible and was impressed by certain things and was impressed by certain things and distressed by uh, certain things. So um, the first thing to note is that Ravenhill is, he he was a good preacher. He was good with words. He knew the word. He knew knew the scriptures. He was uh, capable, very capable in aiming the pointy end of the spear where, where it ought to have been aimed and, and did so. So he was just, he was just good that way. And there are a number of turns of phrase, a number of expressions uh, that I thought were quite good. And listening to this seasoned preacher as a preacher, there was a lot there to appreciate. I also, sometime right before, I looked up, there are some Ravenhill um, clips of him on YouTube, the, in, so you can see him in action, not just read the words on the page in action. Uh, that said, there, there were some things that were distressing about it. He was, he knew the word. He loved the things of God. He wanted God to be honored and glorified above all else, and he um, said so. Just would, just went after it, right? So that was all good, and he, um, he made points that were telling. There were, there were. If you read, I'm assuming that his other books are like this one. And uh, he lands some blows. He he he'll. Um, it's the sort of thing where he can uh, he can get you. And so what's the problem? Now I I don't want to be too severe on this first point because Raven Hill himself might not have done this, but apparently for for someone who is uh, in a for a book that is sort of lifting the name of Christ and let Christ be exalted and let the name of man perish. There was a little weird circumstance that had to do with uh, me listening to the book, and that was uh, each chapter concluded with a poem. Most of the poems were by Leonard Ravenhill, so and he was a uh, and he was competent enough in in his uh, writing of poetry. But each chapter concluded with a poem, and each poem concluded with an at that, uh, with the, uh, that that poem attributed to Leonard Ravenhill. So I'm listening to a book that's all about lifting up the name of Christ, and the man who wrote the book was Leonard Ravenhill, and I heard the name Leonard Ravenhill 
over and over and over again. Now, that decision might have been made not by Leonard Ravenhill, but by some some editor, uh, you know, after Ravenhill passed away. So I, that's that's not something that I want to lay at his feet because I, I don't know that he did it. But I do know that somebody did it, and whoever did it wasn't paying attention to what Ravenhill was talking about in the book. You can't, it is a, I forgot who said this famous preacher's quote, you cannot simultaneously uh, communicate, a man cannot simultaneously communicate that, that he himself is clever and Christ is mighty to save. So if, I, if you're communicating both of those things at once, one of them is going to uh, suffer. One of them is going to take the back seat. And uh, that, that was the case uh, here with this book. Another, another problem with it was that you didn't know how much uh, Ravenhill was saying, thus saith the Lord, because he, was per- he, he had personally had a dogmatic personality, or how much he was saying because this is what the text called for, and when uh, so, so there were times there, you know, when he's talking about abortion, or if he's talking about uh, self uh, self centered religion. I mean, feel free, go to town. But then if he gets on to teetotalism, you know, he he takes he he tells us in a shocked voice that he heard that there was such a thing as a, a man claiming to be a Christian brewer, uh, a brewer of beer. This is a good example of how our traditions can run up behind us, tackle us from behind. And it was a good example of him. He was being just as dogmatic as, as when he was uh, on solid scriptural ground as when he was condemning a man for, doing, uh, for making a product that Jesus would have had no problem drinking. So, take one thing with another. I would say if you're an evangelical Reformed guy, it'd be good to occasionally read Tozer, and I think it'd be good to at least read one book by Ravenhill, just to get a a taste of uh, that style of revival fundamentalism that has some good things to offer. So, there you go. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Canon Plus the all-new, completely rebuilt Canon streaming service. Get access to all of Canon's digital content, with more being added all the time. Check it out at MyCanonPlus.com. That's MyCanonPlus.com.